final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 13714 in the name of James Kelly on which calling time on nuisance call and texts. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to please press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. I would also invite those members who are leaving the chamber to do so quickly and quietly. Please, Mr Kelly, uh, seven minutes when you are ready. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I first of all start by thanking the members across all parties who signed the motion, allowing me to bring this uh, issue of nuisance calls to the debate to the Parliament Chamber uh, this evening. I can also thank uh, Which for the, the work that they've done in support of the Consumer Association's campaign, uh, calling time on nuisance calls uh, and texts. Uh, I think in many ways, this is a very timely debate coming on the day that we see the company Home Energy and Lifestyle Management fined £200,000, a record fine uh, from the ICO for their activity on nuisance uh, calls. Uh, I find it quite staggering that a company can uh, embark on an activity which involves six million unsolicited calls. Uh, and it's, it's no wonder that there was a, a high level of complaint uh, from members of the, the public. I mean, it's quite clear that that kind of activity is completely unacceptable. And a lot of it uh, can end up being focused on people who are pensioners, people who are vulnerable. And I think the job of this parliament tonight is to unite, to uh, pledge that there will be an action plan which will protect consumers protect pensioners, protect vulnerable people and send out the message to companies who embark on these unscrupulous calling campaigns that their activity is unacceptable, it's not on and we will seek to root it out. I think uh, I mentioned you know, pensioners. I, I think one of the things that strikes me when you speak to people who have been the victim of such calls is that for pensioners, many of whom live on their own, the telephone is a very important device because they don't maybe have a lot of personal company and they rely on the phone to get calls from their friends and from their family. Uh, and I know it's the case that pensioners, because of these nuisance calls, have become afraid to answer the phone and therefore are caught in a situation where they might not answer the phone and they might not get a call from uh, a family member or they answer the phone and on the other end they get someone who's trying to take advantage of them and who has uh, been intimidatory in the calls that, that they're making. And we all know that it's a big is issue across, I've spoken to other members, it's a big issue uh, across Scotland and constituencies and, and regions. And what, are the heart, what is at the heart of the activities of these companies is that they're seeking to, you know, uh, take you know, gain money um, from people that they've got on the other end of the phone. Some of it's through unscrupulous business activity and some, you know, just simply con merchants uh, and scamsters. You know, people phoning up saying that they're from the Windows technical team and your computer is broken and you need to, need to give, immediately give them their credit card details in order to stop the virus uh, moving through your computer or phoning people up saying that they're entitled to a, you know, a, a free grant or a free payment. And it's all about trying to extract um, bank card information so that they can, they can, then, be used, um, they can ne then be used to uh, you know, unscrupulously take money off people. It's just totally unacceptable. And the scale of the problem, uh, there's no doubt that it is a huge um, it affects, you know, a billion of these calls take place uh, UK-wide. Uh, eight out of ten people find them annoying. A third of people find them intimidating. And that's the other thing. People on the other end of the phone can be, can be very aggressive, um, can be very intimidating, uh, and it's just totally unacceptable. It's a big issue in my constituency of Rutherglen, Cambus, Lang and Blantyre. There are a lot of pensioners in that area, and a lot of people have raised it with me. Uh, is a real matter of concern. It's something that has, has grown uh, in recent years. I think the other thing about these companies is that some of them just treat the process and treat people with absolute contempt. 
the Sunday Post uh, on Sunday revealed that there had been 1.4 million in uh, fines uh, handed out uh, in terms of uh, the, the unacceptable activity, but over a million of that hadn't actually been paid at this point. Um, so I think more has to be done to not only ensure that companies realise that this is not on, but in raking in and taking back in uh, payments for fines. You know, some of the, the contempt is just totally unacceptable. I mean, one company featured in the Sunday Post cold call elimination, who'd been fined £75,000, were actually phoning up, pretending to be from the government or from British Telecom. Uh, and that is just totally unacceptable to people. What I would like to see from the, the Minister and from the government is the publication of an action plan to tackle nuisance calls. I think at the, at the forefront it should set out that these calls and unscrupulous activity are completely unacceptable. I think there's more can be done to ensure that companies take the issue more seriously, that they have a board level director that takes responsibility uh, for calls. I think we need to focus on the issue of uh, data and people's rights. Uh, a lot of the way that people are able to make these calls is the way that they gather data from you know, other sources, email sources, or financial transactions. And people need to be better advised as to their rights in terms of uh, passing data across. I think the government itself can look at its own procurement processes so that it is involved in farming out any calling activity, it can ensure that it takes on companies that do it uh, in a proper and uh, acceptable manner. Sure. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. I am grateful to the member taking intervention. I would just like to highlight in relation to the particular example that has been used today, the Scottish Government was not responsible for the, the company's activities and we were not responsible for that particular case, but I take the point in general uh, and, and board. Mr. Kelly. No, I, I accept that point, Mr. Wheelhouse. And if you look, I was careful not to make any implication between the, the, any link between the Scottish Government and the, the company that was mentioned today. I'm well aware that that's not a company that the, the, the Scottish Government use in terms of the Green Deal. Um, I think more has to, to be done in terms of working with telephone providers, so that you know caller line identification can be provided, and also the telephone preference service could be made uh, better use of. And I think all this can be rolled up into a public information campaign. I think, in summing up, there will be a lot of agreement across the Chamber, a lot of concern about the activities of companies that embark on nuisance calling. I think we need to make it loud and clear that it is unacceptable. Uh, we need to expose the con merchants and the scamsters, and we need to root them out so that we can protect... Uh, those who are vulnerable, those who are pensioners in their communities, and make sure that they're safe to use their phones in their own house. Hey, thanks. I now call on Graham Day to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I congratulate James Kelly on securing this debate and for the, the passion he showed on in uh, articulating his concerns on this subject. I, I signed Mr Kelly's motion literally within seconds of finding it in my inbox. Its arrival could not have been better timed. I just put the phone down on my 78-year-old mother, mum, who had been telling me about an unsolicited call she would fielded earlier that day. That call from a young man had offered a bargain deal on a system which he claimed would ensure she would never receive cold calls again. She was told she was getting a special offer because the area she lives in, just outside Aberdeen, had been specifically targeted by these unscrupulous firms. For the half-price rate of £2 a month for three years, she could be assured of no longer being subjected to nuisance calls. All she had to do was, well, you know what's coming next, don't you, was provide card details and the security number on the back of the card. When she told them she had no intention of providing such details, the individual concern promptly hung up. Who knows how many folk may have fallen victims of this scam. As my mother rather amusingly put it, she has all her marbles, but there are some poor old dears out there. It was good to see the cross-party support that this motion garnered, though perhaps not entirely surprising given it was lodged during the summer recess when colleagues, if they were like me, were themselves being exposed to the full annoyance of the nuisance calling. There were days when I was at home over the summer when I felt under siege from these automatically generated calls. Being in the parliamentary office offered little respite either, as it gets regular calls too. 
I'm led to believe some of these automated calls, where no one comes on the other end when you answer, are actually probing in nature, aimed at determining whether anyone is at home during the daytime, and therefore whether follow-up calls is, are likely to prove worthwhile. The unwarranted intrusion on in people's lives, whoever they are, is frankly unacceptable. And perhaps I should at this stage declare a very personal interest in this subject, born of something which happened to my family a little under a year ago, when the shameless nature of these companies was lay, laid bare to us. Having just taken a call from the hospital, summoning us to my dad's bedside as his health was deteriorating rapidly, the phone went again. It was a gentleman phoning, I suspect, from India. Before I could stop him, he'd given me his name and advised. He was calling to discuss an issue I was having with my computer. He was rather bluntly advised of how welcome his call was, that we were dealing with a family crisis, and he was not to call again. Fast forward a week, and as we were about to leave home for Dad's funeral, the phone went again. It was not only the same scamming firm, but the very same individual. So on behalf of myself, my family, and many, many constituents, President Officer, I offer my unreserved support to this witch campaign. This problem is not going away. In a five or six month period earlier this year, the Information Commissioner's Office received more than 61,000 official complaints about nuisance calls or texts. And with just one in 50 of people writing to bother with contacting the regulator, we can, I think, deduce that in reality there are millions of such calls being received. I'm grateful to which for providing sample comments from constituents who talk of the ignoring, uh, ignoring of TPS registration, receiving up to 20 of these calls a day, already challenging caring situations being impacted upon by this menace, and a fear that these calls are being used to determine whether the House may be empty. Presiding officer, as the constituency MSP representing these folk, I'm one of the eight out of ten people who support greater accountability over nuisance calls, including directors of these companies being personally fined for rule breaches. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Liam MacArthur to be followed by Christine Graham. Uh, thank you very much. And can I start by apologising to you and to the Chamber uh, for the need to leave slightly early this evening, but congratulate uh, James Kelly on securing this important debate, one which mirrors one I led myself uh, three years ago on the same issue. But as Graham Day has rightly said, this is a problem that's not going away and therefore I think it's important that Parliament has a further opportunity to voice its strong and united support for the campaign to call time on nuisance calls and texts. This is an issue that affects people right across the country in a campaign that enjoys strong cross-party support. And I commend the Consumer Association and WITS for their tireless campaigning on the issue. They are right to argue for more action, but also, I think, deserve credit for some of the progress already achieved. Uh, I do, though, have one complaint about their briefing for this debate. It fails to acknowledge uh, the pivotal role played by my former colleague, Mike Crockart, who led this campaign at Westminster during the last parliamentary session. Indeed, uh, Mike Crockart was uh, instrumental in encouraging which to take up this issue, and I know both worked extremely well together in gathering support, around 250,000 uh, at last count, and securing important changes. Credit, too, I think, is due to the Sunday Post for championing this cause and for encouraging people both to share their experiences as well as to sign up for the campaign. And this campaign has been successful. Since we previously debated the issue, the Information Commissioner's Office now has increased powers to take enforcement action against firms making nuisance calls. That was something that members in the previous debate all called for, and I'm pleased that those calls were heeded by the previous UK coalition government. Under this change, the ICO no longer has to prove that calls are causing, quote, substantial damage or substantial distress before taking action. I dare say that this change had a role to play in the ICO earlier today, handing out a fine of £200,000, the largest yet, as referred to by James Kelly. But while progress has been made, more is undoubtedly needed, which are calling for legislation to be introduced to hold board-level executives to account for the actions of their company. At the very least, we need companies to take compliance with the law and consumer consent seriously at board level. BT and SSE are leading the way. Others must follow, and I think the UK government and the Scottish government can play a part in encouraging others to do so. 
which also want to see caller line identification made mandatory for all marketing calls. Without this, it is hard to see how those bombarded by nuisance calls and texts will be able to report the company or make a request to be removed from their database. And I think this is imperative. Many of my constituents, like those of uh, other members, no doubt, have clearly found that the current telephone preference system is ineffective and therefore these additional safeguards are needed. I heard of one case earlier today where a friend was called by the British Government Grants Department in return for paying his taxes and maintaining good relations uh, with the, the British Government. Uh, no mean feat for an ardent yes supporter, I would su suggest. He was entitled to a grant of £1,800. Uh, when asked he's aged, uh, my friend said 123, at which point the line strangely went dead. Such calls though, uh, are a nuisance. But describing them as such perhaps risks underestimating the effect they can have, particularly on the vulnerable. One Orkney constituent described them uh, like a personal assault. Last time I highlighted the case of a constituent whose elderly mother, a dementia sufferer, had been repeatedly called and pressed into taking a broadband package. She finally relented and signed up for the expensive offer, despite not even having a computer. It took months to get her money back. But this case at least ended positively. Many, many more do not. Deputy Presiding Officer, if this was happening face to face, if payday loan sharks or PPI litigators were knocking on the doors of the elderly and the vulnerable in our communities, then either running away or bullying them into making claims, we'd be up in arms. Just because the constant badgering and intimidation happens over the phone does not make it okay or any less frightening to vulnerable people. And yet that is the everyday reality for far too many. It can't continue. It must stop. So again, I thank James Kelly on allowing this debate to happen. I apologise to him, to you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and the, and the Chamber for not being able to stay to the end. And I congratulate which and wish them well on their ongoing campaign to call an end to nuisance calls and hope Mike Crocker feels a sense of justifiable pride in a very worthwhile campaign he helped to start. Thank you. Thanks so much. And I now call on Christine Graham to be followed by Nanette Milne. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I sincerely congratulate James Kelly on securing this debate and endorse everything that has been said so far, in particular regarding the harassment and bullying, particularly of elderly and vulnerable people and the scams. There cannot be one of us who has not raged against those unsolicited calls. I really only had to suffer them when I was more likely to be at home, say, during recess. But what other people put up with all the time, goodness knows. You'd just be stepping out of the shower, weeding at the bottom of the garden or at the top of the stairs with your arms laden with ironing, and you'd run to the phone, especially if you're waiting for a vital phone call, to either find no one on the line or a sales pitch. It got to the stage where I simply didn't answer the phone and let the answer phone gather the bona fide messages. Indeed, my son used to say to me, why don't you pick up the phone, Mum? I says, because it's always these unsolicited calls. But my late father was full of mischief and he had his own way of dealing with these calls. He was in his 90s. He would settle down for a long, meandering conversation with these people and then when he had enough, declare that he had diarrhea. Inevitably, the caller put down the phone. They're not to blame. They were just doing their job and probably had a first-class degree in chemistry, but they always <laughs> apologised profusely. I thought this was entertaining, by the way, until he deployed the same excuse on me when he was fed up talking to me. That said, it's mainly elderly and housebound people who cannot escape this telephonic bombardment. So the campaign by which hits all the right buttons, and through which I have comments from my own constituents in Midlothian, and it's really what we already know. I'm disabled and sometimes trip trying to reach the phone before it goes to the answer machine. Another. Normally, I ignore calls from numbers I don't know, but recently, due to having to deal with care agencies for a family member, I have to answer my phone. And when it's a nuisance call, it infuriates me. I'm a pensioner, and they just don't give up. Even when you say you're not interested, they probably redouble their efforts. I receive nuisance calls, even at 8.30 on a Sunday morning. I want something done to stop them. And another one, many older people I know get very worried and frightened by these calls and feel they have to respond. Now, I took things into my own hands. I'd had enough. So I've installed my own solution. I, it's a BT phone. Now, I'm not in product placement, so I'm not telling you what it is, but it's got a call blocking device. It doesn't ring unless the caller identifies themselves and I have a list of callers who are automatically put through. If you're not on my list, I either accept if I'm in by pressing one 
or a message has to be left. Now, so if you want to get in touch with me, you'll have to get on my special list. But I'll tell you, I've not had another nuisance call and I am liberated. And you're not in the position where you hear the phone ringing, you're waiting to hear from your family in Canada, or you're waiting to hear the terrible circumstances that Graham Day has explained, and you rush to the phone and there's this person in the end who, as I say, is doing their job it's a terrible job to do, and no matter how much you try to resist telling them to do you'll get calls again. So I have no more nuisance calls. If you want to be on my list, come and speak to me. I recommend this to you all. It's not too expensive, but as I say, I'm not in product placement. I'm not getting paid to do this for BT, who has their faults. But if you go on the internet, this is a sound solution. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now I call on Nanette Milne to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Follow that. Um, th thank you, um, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I, too, extend my thanks to James Kelly for securing the debate on an issue which isn't just an irritant, but it can be an extremely stressful experience for vulnerable people. Often elderly people who may live on their own will feel disappointed when the phone rings and thinking it may be a child or a grandchild on the line, struggle to the phone to discover it's a cold caller trying to sell insurance or whatever. Even more irritating is the increased number of nuisance calls, which are automated voice recordings. I was off work for a few weeks recently, suffering from a rather nasty attack of shingles. And anyone here who's experienced this debilitating condition will be aware of just how painful it can be and the lethargy which goes with it. During that time, our phone rang at least half a dozen times every day. The callers from companies or lobbyists trying to sell me something, and often these calls were automated with only silence on the end of the line. Having to get out of my chair to answer the phone or being wakened up from an exhausted sleep was not a pleasant experience. I assume these calls happen every day, even when I'm not at home, and I can imagine how irritating they must be to people who are housebound, frightening too, when there's no voice on the other end. When I was returning to Parliament last week, still not feeling 100%, I got onto the 546 train from Aberdeen, having been dropped off by my husband at the station. I had my luggage with me, but suddenly realised I'd left my handbag in the car. So I was stranded in the station with no phone, no money and no cards. The very helpful ScotRail staff phoned home for me and gave me a welcome cup of coffee. But my husband very nearly didn't respond, because at that time of the morning, he assumed it was probably a nuisance call. Fortunately, he did eventually get the message and returned my handbag in time for me to get the next train to Edinburgh and arrive at the Health Committee shortly after the start of the meeting. I mention these personal experiences, presiding officer, to highlight the nature of how unsolicited telephone calls can affect people's everyday lives. And I'm grateful to Sarah Chisnell for working with which in providing me with comments from people in my northeast region, some 300 in total, who have complained about these types of calls. Obviously, I don't have time to quote all the comments, but two stuck in my mind. I'm fed up with my 80-year-old parents being pestered by computer companies, accident claim companies, etc. They don't even own a computer, but are constantly called by these people. And my 83-year-old father is receiving at least six unsolicited calls a day. His phone is his lifeline, and he's now scared to answer it due to these cold callers. Presiding officer, like many other people, I've signed up to TPS, but this is consistently ignored. And I agree with my constituent who said it's, it's an invasion of privacy. We've opted into TPS and still get inundated with sales calls, including abusive scam computer calls from overseas. And if I may digress for a moment, it's not just news and calls which can be irritating. At home, we have a fax machine which can whirl away at 4 a.m., offering products we don't need and waking us up in the process. And to me, when the phone rings at that time of day, I immediately think there must be some family emergency. I very much welcome the proactive calling time campaign by the Consumer Association, as cold calling has gone far too far. And this week's action by the ICO, giving a 200 fine to Home Energy and Lifestyle Management Limited for nuisance calls, is something I hope will set an example to others. I'm not going to make any suggestions as to what the UK government should or shouldn't do, but I do feel that businesses based in Scotland should be encouraged to implement best practice and make a voluntary commitment to tackling nuisance calls. Again, my thanks to James Kelly for sponsoring the debate. Thank you. Thank you too. And I call on Kenny Gibson to be followed by Paul Martin. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I, too, would like to offer my congratulations to James Kelly for securing uh, this debate today. 
It is unquestionable that nuisance calls have increased in volume in recent years. With little oversight or accountability, more and more companies are using technology to create mass phone messages and unsolicited calls to individuals throughout the UK. Richard Lloyd, Executive Director of Witch, described nuisance calls as a scourge on people's lives. Indeed, just before I left the office this evening, my assistant received a nuisance call on her mobile phone. Not only was it an automated message, but it was also a fraudulent call trying to scare her, warning that her payment protection insurance was at risk. Ironically, she just read of similar scenarios from constituents. Fortunately, my assistant knew this call was a scam and disregarded it. Unfortunately, however, many others uh, may not be so up to date or aware of the latest tricks employed during these calls. And as colleagues have said, many of our more vulnerable constituents may not discern the potential harm. Indeed, some are at risk of having their personal information compromised and or stolen. Though fraudulent calls represent the most extreme of cases and most calls are irritating, uh, uh, um, uh, still action must be taken to stop them from escalating further. It's said that six out of ten householders say nuisance calls are so bad they no longer want to answer their own home telephone. It's sad that over half our constituents no longer want to answer their own phone for fear of unsolicited calls. And it's time to hold unscrupulous businesses accountable before 10 out of 10 households no longer, no longer answer their phones. The Communications Act 2003 gave the Office of Communications power to deal with the persistent misuse of a communications network or service. Ofcom classified that misuse of communications includes the generation of unsolicited and unwanted calls and silent calls. Ofcom's research reported that during a six-month period in 2012, almost half of all adults with a landline experienced a silent call, which is up a quarter since 2011. Over the same period, 71% of landline customers said, said they received a live marketing call and 63% a recorded marketing message. Currently, the Information Commissioner's Office also enforces breaches of the privacy and electronic communications. In April uh, 2013, TalkTalk Talk was fined three quarters of a million pounds for making around 9,000 abandoned or silent calls. And just yesterday, as uh, James Kelly pointed out, the ICO fined the Green Energy Company Home Energy and Lifestyle Management Limited £200,000. Although I'm happy to see that some companies are being held accountable for their actions, these fines represent little compared to the action that still needs to be taken. Currently, a consumer can be taken off a calling list by including their number on the telephone preference service. But undeterred, as Nanette Milne alluded to, companies have found loopholes to contact consumers and few penalties have been imposed on companies contacting those on the TPS list. One of my constituents advises me that she receives nuisance calls every day, frequently from the same people. Indeed, Graham Day touched on that. On most occasions, there is no number available and no method of redress. Despite being registered by TPS, my constituent receives these calls incessantly. Which has set out recommendations to introduce a mandatory caller line identification for all marketing calls to provide a key piece of information when reporting an unwanted caller or contacting a company to request removal from their database. Clearly, this would be a welcome step in the right direction. People may inadvertently give permission for unsolicited callers to contact them by ticking boxes on various websites. Sometimes these tick boxes provide permission for companies to give information to third parties. To raise awareness, it would be beneficial if there was an industry standard for private notices. Further to this, individuals should have more rights and control over personal data, and it should be made easier for them to revoke their permission or consent to be con contacted. Signing officer, there seems to be a lack of uniformity among nuisance calls, a reluctance to punish those in contravention of the rules and practice already in place, and the witch campaign to create legislation which will make senior executives accountable for law of their company's nuisance calls would make companies less likely to breach guidelines. However, great accountability, caller identification and more control over how personal data is used is badly needed to bring this problem under control, granting our constituents peace of mind. Thank you, Thank you very much. Now I call on Paul Martin, after which we move the closing speech from the Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Can I, like others, uh, congratulate uh, James Kelly in highlighting uh, an issue that has been raised by many of us? And, uh, can I say also to uh, congratulate which uh, and their excellent campaign in highlighting this issue to the parliamentarians. Can I just, I think all of us need to recognise the fact that we have uh, not only been able to highlight the cases of our constituents, but also our personal experiences. And I can say that I've been placed, I placed myself on uh, a TPS register with the same results as others. Uh, and indeed, following my uh, commitment to TPS, I actually found that the calls increased as a result 
uh, of that reference and, and, and committing to that process. So I think there are many challenges. And in fact, I think if the industry doesn't wake up to some of the challenges that face people, then people will go about uh, disconnecting their landlines. I actually think if it wasn't for the fact uh, that consumers require landlines uh, for broadband access, then many people would actually do that because most people make use uh, of mobile calls and may actually move towards that uh, if, in fact, this can't be taken forward. I know from personal experiences, I find uh, the same as uh, others have referred to, that answering telephone calls in, in the home has just been dealing with uh, nuisance calls, and I think that's a challenge it faces. But can I highlight one particular case that was raised with me by uh, Margaret and Jim Watson? Uh, members will be uh, maybe aware of Margaret and Jim Watson, who gave evidence to the Levison inquiry uh, in connection with the sad loss of their son and daughter uh, in respect to the, a, a Diane and Alan. Uh, and they raised a specific case with me in connection with the fact that the Margaret was receiving over 80 calls a month uh, from unsolicited uh, organisations who were making unsolicited calls. This is an issue that she tried to raise with many of these companies directly. And Margaret, I think, made a very uh, good point to me on a number of occasions, which was, how do you make complaints about these companies? What is the complaints process when the individual at the other end won't identify who the organisation is? And that's why I think uh, compulsory identify identification, caller ID, that requires these companies to give that information is crucial. But I also don't think the consumer should have to pay for that. Uh, and I think that's another challenge. I think Christine Graham's uh, set out a very effective way of dealing with these calls. But it does require an investment to do that. And there are many consumers who are not in a position uh, to put in place those kind of call barring systems. So I actually think it should be up to the telephone providers uh, to provide uh, this service free of charge. Christine Graham. Dean Graham. To say I absolutely agree with you that I was in a position to do that because I was just so sick to death of it. But I absolutely accept it shouldn't be what people have to do. Paul Martin. And, and I think this is where the presiding officer of the industry can take this forward. Uh, they need to recognise that consumers won't be in a position to do that. And perhaps if it was the default position that you could have put in place a call barring service for the preventing those with unidentified numbers making contact with you in a similar way in which... Uh, Christine Graham referred to screening, then perhaps we could move forward in that respect. And I do think the industry does have to consider uh, technological advances and looking at perhaps barring uh, overseas calls, dealing with many of the challenges in that respect as well. can also touch on the point, I think is a relevant point that Kenny Gibson referred to, the very fact that many of us will make use of these price comparison websites. And we will tick that box or untick that box at the bottom uh, that disclaimer, and I think that has to be much clearer who this information will be provided to, and I think that's the challenge that faces many of us. When we ask these companies who provided the information to them, usually it's a third-party marketing company, uh, and it's very difficult then to find out who disclosed the information in the first place. And I think we should put uh, a, a, an action plan in place to deal with that very issue. Can I say in conclusion, uh, President Officer, I think it is welcomed uh, that Helms have seen a significant, we have seen a significant, significant fine in place to deal with uh, the Helms uh, Green Energy Company. I actually think we need to think about the fact that should automated calls uh, be considered an appropriate way of contacting uh, people in any form? Should we look at the possible ban of automated calls? I don't know anybody who wants an automated call. Uh, and I think that's something that we have to consider whether that is an appropriate means are making contact with consumers, and perhaps that's a practice that should be uh, considered uh, for future, uh, we should consider uh, in the future. Uh, Presenting also just conclusion, well done to, to James Kelly in this debate, and I think we can move forward hopefully in partnership with the government with the appropriate action plan. Many thanks. And I now call on Minister Paul Wheelhouse to close uh, this debate on behalf of the government. Seven minutes or thereby, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to thank members who have uh, already taken part in today's debate, and in particular James Kelly, uh, both for initiating this debate and his work in recent months to highlight the issue of nuisance calls, which affects far too many people across Scotland. Uh, I would add myself to the list of people who have suffered the, the, the consequences of nuisance calls. Um, these text, calls and texts are, for many, uh, perhaps an unwelcome annoyance. For me, that's the limit to the impact they had on me. But we do have to recognise, as many members have said today, in many cases, they can have a far greater impact, causing significant distress, particularly for the elderly and the vulnerable. Um, I think it was the case that um, 
Uh, a number of members, uh, James uh, Kelly himself, mentioned first the, the isolation that many elderly and vulnerable people feel, uh, how much worse it is when they feel they can't even pick up the phone and miss that vital family call from a family member. And I think people uh, who are organising these kind of calls really have to take a long, hard look at themselves as to the nature and the impact they're having on vulnerable individuals. Um, the contribution that WITCH has made to promote uh, the consumer agenda, as well as the excellent work carried out by its task force, only serves to highlight how important this issue remains. And as a number of members have stated, eight out of every 10 consumers surveyed say that they are regularly cold called at home. Even more worryingly, as some have said, a third of those went on to suggest that the calls leave them feeling intimidated. Now, if people are feeling intimidated by a, a sales call, that really uh, is clearly unacceptable. Of course, regulation of nuisance calls and texts is currently reserved uh, to UK Government, although the new Scotland Bill will devolve certain consumer uh, and competition powers to the Scottish Parliament that will give us more of a chance uh, to shape a more effective Scottish response to these consumer issues. Um, notwithstanding that, I would, I would add that I do not believe that the relevant clauses of the draft bill uh, currently give full effect to the intention of the Smith Agreement. Uh, however, we shall ensure that those further powers that do come to Scotland are put to maximum effect. Uh, but we shall also continue to seek to ensure that provisions in the Bill fully re reflect the spirit and the letter of the Smith recommendations on consumer protection and competition policy. In, in this context, the Consumer and Competition Policy Working Group is currently considering optimal arrangements for delivering consumer and competition services in Scotland under the Bill. And at the heart of our approach is the need to put the interests of consumers first. Uh, the Scottish Government will work in partnership with interested groups such as which uh, to create an integrated consumer protection regime in Scotland that provides greater clarity on where to turn for help and advice. And in the meantime, we will continue to work with the UK Government to ensure that the regime governing nuisance calls and texts is made as effective as possible. The changes that the UK Government have proposed to legislation around enforcement will have an impact and this will make it easier to impose fines on those companies that aggressively target consumers through unsolicited calls and text. I was certainly, uh, I'm sure members across the chamber would be horrified by the experience that Graham Day uh, experienced in a very tragic time and that just stands to serve when the same individual uh, calls back and can't take on board that he's contacted someone in an extremely distressing time and to leave them alone, that tells us we have a, a lot of work to do. But the UK Government has also made a commitment to consult on mandatory calling line identification. I think a number of members, James Kelly, Kenneth Gibson, Paul Martin, and indeed uh, Christine Graham, raised that point. And indeed, uh, not that I can recommend any particular company or technology, it was interesting to hear that there are, uh, there are uh, technologies available to cut out um, those numbers that um, don't have caller line identification. Under such a scheme, though, if uh, mandatory calling line identification were to be extended, telemarketers would be required to display a valid telephone number and would not be permitted to withhold that number. But we believe the UK Government can go further, and they are in the process of reviewing a number of other recommendations made by which is task force. These suggest giving regulators, notably the, the ICO, further powers to hold individual board members to account when their companies use consumers' personal data for marketing purposes. The task force also proposed a review of the UK Government's Nuisance Calls Action Plan to set out ways in which enforcement action could be made more effective. And they suggested that the UK Government leads development of a cross-sector business awareness campaign to share best practice. And that public authorities also uh, support the take-up of accreditation schemes such as the Telephone Preference Service. I have to stress my own experiences. I'm registered with that, but still get, uh, unfortunately, a high volume of nuisance calls, uh, as does Paul Martin, uh, indeed. And this is a complex area, and there are no instant solutions. But the Scottish Government believes that far more can be done at the UK level to make regulation enforcement work more effectively for consumers. And we will work with the UK Government in, insofar as we have a role to, to make that happen. We believe the UK Government should seek to work with industry to introduce a mandatory code of business practice. A clear expiry date on personal consent to third party marketing should all be, also be established. I think that would help with the problem that Paul Martin and others have identified. It is also vital that the terminology used in consent boxes, as Kenneth Gibson referred to, which indicate that the consumer has or has not agreed to receive calls or texts, is clear, fair, and fit for purpose. Uh, and the Scottish Government also believes that the current uh, UK wide regulation of nuisance calls and texts is needlessly fragmented. The Telephone Preference Service, the Information Commissioner's Office and Ofcom all currently play a regulatory role. This fragmentation means that victims of nuisance calls and texts often face having to register their complaints with different organisations depending on the exact nature of that complaint. And in fact, uh, which uh, set up a web portal to direct consumers to the relevant regulator. 
Data shows that only around half the people who use it, used it went on to make a full complaint, suggesting that many people find the current complaints process to be too onerous. And we appreciate the work that all three organisations do to articulate good practice and to provide advice to businesses and the general public. But the Scottish Government believes there is still room for improvement, and that is why in our Consumer prote uh, Protection and Representation in an Independent Scotland Options paper, I am not making this point for constitutional reasons, we did make a strong case for a single body that would have had responsibility for regulation of nuisance calls and texts. This would have allowed for more effective protection of the public than that provided under the current UK regulation. And, and nuisance calls can also lead to significant financial difficulties for consumers, particularly in the area of payday loans. We see too many cases in which unsolicited marketing calls from payday loan providers and debt management companies have resulted in a consumer's financial position being jeopardised and the devolution of power to reduce the proliferation of um, establishments offering these services would also allow the Scottish Government to address concerns more effectively. Uh, before I close, presiding officer, I just want to, to ask, uh, maybe perhaps given Christine Graham's intervention, if I could be added to her special list, um, I, 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 just to, to, to make sure that's the case. Um, but I, I do note that uh, in dealing with some of the points that are raised by members, one thing that strikes me, obviously, in community safety role as well, the thought that individuals perhaps would suffer trips or falls, um, vulnerable people trying to make it to a phone call, perhaps expecting a family member or waiting for an emergency call, indeed if it's at an inappropriate time of the day, I might expect it to be a family member in distress, could have an accidental fall and trip. That could cause a house fire, it could cause obviously a long-term injury, or even as we know with hip fractures, it can be potentially fatal for, for very vulnerable individuals. So um, I think, again, I would urge the companies involved to look to their conscience on that front. But nuisance calls and texts are undoubtedly an issue for which there is no quick fix. However, the Scottish Government is committed to acting decisively this, on this issue. We will work to ensure, with the UK Government, where that, that is appropriate, that the needs of consumers are put first, taking Scottish-specific issues into account in a way that the current uh, fragmented arrangements have failed perhaps to do. The greater powers in consumer and competition policy being devolved to our Parliament under the new Scotland Bill can offer us the opportunity to transform consumer protection in Scotland. And I assure members the Scottish Government will use powers effectively in that respect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and thank you all for taking part in this important debate. I now close this meeting of Parliament.